Today is the second Sunday of Lent. The theme of our reflection is the transfiguration and the real identity of the Son of God. One may immediately wonder how this theme connects to the first reading from the book of Genesis. In the Christian Bible, this story is often titled, The Sacrifice of Isaac. But Isaac was never sacrificed. The Jews correctly call this story Akedah, from the verb Akad, which means to bind or to tie up. So it is the binding of Isaac. Another point is that most commentators focus on Abraham's faith downplaying the role of Isaac. We can only understand Isaac's role in this narrative if we look at it typologically, that is a story that foreshadows the Son of God, especially in his suffering and death on the cross. A few elements can make this clearer. First, the binding or supposed sacrifice took place on a mountain, in this case Mount Moria. Second, three times in the narrative, God refers to Isaac as Bencha Asher Avatar in Hebrew, or to who you so to Agape to in Greek, your beloved son. Who is called the beloved son in the gospel? Third, Isaac took the wood of his own sacrifice up the mountain. Fourth, his father Abraham obeys the voice of God to sacrifice his son. But the son makes no resistance even when his father laid him on the wood of the cross. Fifth, Abraham laid his son on the wood. Jesus in the transfiguration prepares for his passion where he would lay down his life on the wood of the cross. Finally, we hear the voice of God call out to Abraham just as the voice of God is heard at the baptism and transfiguration. Today God calls out to each one of us as his beloved children. But can we listen and respond in faith and in obedience like Abraham, like Isaac, like Jesus? In his letter to the Romans, Paul taught and developed sound doctrinal instructions about Jesus. In chapter 8, he emphasized the Holy Spirit's supernatural power and revealed the human inability to defeat sin. So, in our passage, when he says, If God is for us, who can be against us? He resounds the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, that with God, all things are possible. The fact that God will give us all we need for our Christian life and salvation. He further says in verse 32 that he who did not spare his son but gave him up for us all, will he not give us all things? Here Paul alludes to Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. And he recounts God's words in verse 12 and verse 16 when he says, You have not withheld your son, your beloved son, from me. So just as Abraham was loyal to God and ready to sacrifice his dearest possession, so is God faithful to us to sacrifice his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him will have everlasting life. John 3.16 in verses 33 to 34, Paul raises some rhetorical questions to drive home his point. Who can accuse God's chosen ones? It is God who declares us not guilty. And who can condemn? Is it Jesus who intercedes for us? So since God has acquitted us, no one can condemn us. For the one who has the authority to charge us is Jesus 
seated at God's right hand, interceding for us. We are safe. We are in good hands. He identifies four things about Jesus and his mission. That he died, rose from the dead, seated at the, at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. These we recite in the Apostles' Creed that Christ was crucified, died, and was buried. He rose again on the third day, seated at the right hand of the Father, to judge the living and the dead. Jesus, who is the judge, does not condemn us. He advocates our cause, interceding for us. Therefore, we can rejoice that we are truly acquitted, not because we are deserving of it, but because of God's love in Christ Jesus who died for us to save us and who continues to advocate and to plead our cause. The Gospel reading from Mark chapter 9 verses 2 to 10 is the account of the transfiguration of Jesus. Jesus is up a high mountain with three of his disciples, Peter, James and John. Suddenly, his clothes become dazzling white, beyond the capacity of any bleach. Then appear Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus. The three disciples are frightened and do not know what to make of the event. When Peter eventually summons courage to speak, he acknowledges the beauty of the encounter they were witnessing and proposes to prepare three tents for Jesus, Moses and Elijah. Before Peter could get a response, a cloud overshadows them and from the cloud emerges a voice saying, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. As they look around, probably trying to decipher to whom the voice was referring, no one else was there but Jesus alone. A clear indication that Jesus indeed is the son of God and the beloved one in question. While making their way down the mountain, Jesus orders them not to tell anyone what they saw until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And so they kept what they saw close to their chest, pondering what rising from the dead could mean. This event of the transfiguration is situated six days after Jesus' first prediction of his passion in Matthew 8, 31-38. The number six in the Bible often connotes incompleteness and imperfection. Thus, it suggests that the passion prediction that the Son of Man must undergo suffering, rejection and death, which got the disciples so worried, is not the complete account of the Christ event. It was to be completed and perfected by the glorious encounter at the transfiguration and the prediction that this same Son of Man will rise from the dead. Although the prediction of Jesus' resurrection was already contained even in the Passion prediction, it seems to have escaped the attention of the disciples. But now, after witnessing the glory of the transfiguration, they could hear clearly the resurrection prediction and could now fix their minds on it, trying to figure out its implications. Now, the transfiguration, which becomes the moment of exclusive and undiluted revelation of the glory of the Son of Man is witnessed by three disciples, three being also a significant number in the Bible, exclusive yet complete and perfect. Jesus ordered the disciples not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. What is it that they saw? They saw Jesus in the company of the great prophets of Israel, Moses and Elijah. Thus, Jesus was not in opposition, but in harmony with the greatest of Old Testament prophetic traditions, together forming the exclusive but perfect cycle of three, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. What else did the disciples see? They saw a cloud overshadow them on the mountain, from which a voice proclaimed Jesus as the beloved Son. Both the mountain and the cloud are associated with the presence of God in the Old Testament. In Exodus 24 verses 15 to 18, the Lord called Moses on Mount Sinai from the midst of the cloud. In Exodus 40, 34 to 38, we read that the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the presence of the Lord filled the tabernacle. 
Also in Exodus 13, 21 to 22, the Lord led Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and of fire by night. We can see also in Nehemiah 9, 12. All these elements combine to demonstrate the fact of God's presence with Jesus. It also shows us how suffering, rejection, and death, which the disciples so feared in the Passion Prediction, is not the point of arrival, but a necessary path to the ultimate manifestation of Jesus' glory in the resurrection. For us Christians, these days of Lent are supposed to be our journey with Christ in His Passion, a journey which is incomplete in itself, unless it leads us towards a befitting celebration of Christ's resurrection at Easter. The Devar Adonai team thanks you for listening and may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. To follow our reflections for Sundays and solemnities, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow our Facebook page, Devar Adonai, or visit our website devaradonai.org